thank you for that special. Praise the Lord. And uh, what a wonderful truth uh, that that song has for us. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number three. Wonderful chapter in the Bible. This would fall into the category of favorite Bible stories. If you were dealing with the young people, then the Sunday school class. Uh, what, is your, what is one of your favorite Bible stories? And oftentimes they will talk about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so we are uh, going to look at chapter number three of the book of Daniel. And I want to give you some practical observations about these three Hebrew boys that we see in Daniel chapter number three. I would like to read together just number verse number 28 as we look at this. We're going to be looking at the whole chapter in just a moment. We'll read together just verse number 28. So let's all stand together if you are able to. Daniel chapter 3, and you can follow along in verse number 28. Daniel 3, 28 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. What a wonderful, wonderful verse. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get into our message tonight, Lessons from the Three Hebrew Boys. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we can understand it. Thank you that we can know it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to um, be affected by your word. Lord, I pray that you would just do a work in our hearts tonight as we consider serving you and trusting and yielding and serving and worshiping you. Um, Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand the importance of this, the stand that these three young men took and how we, can, we ourselves can be the same in doing right. Uh, bless this time, Lord. Open up our hearts and do a work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We can learn a lot about this from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Wonderful, wonderful chapter. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter number 3, verse number 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image, image of gold whose height was three score cubits and breadth thereof six cubits. He set it upon the plain of Dura and the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, and the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers and provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down, and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, all that time when all of the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all the kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whosoever falleth not down and worship it, that he shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace." There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image 
which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego. That they, uh, uh, then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Uh, do not ye have serve? Do not ye serve my God, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have set up well. But if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, or said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded that the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fire furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats and other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And if I was reading this to my kids, this is what I would say at this point. They're goners. They were cast into the fiery furnace. What's going to happen to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? <laughs> Verse 22, therefore, because the king commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and arose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast men, uh, three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Verse 26, And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Jadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, uh, Meshach, and uh, Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire and the princes, the governors, the captains, the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was the hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Verse 28, this is the verse that we read. This is the verse I have underlined in my Bible. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god therefore i make a decree that every people nation and language would speak anything amiss against the god of shadrach meshach and abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses should be made a dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wonderful, wonderful chapter of scripture. Three young men decided they weren't going to bow down to this golden image that was made. They're going to worship the God that they've always served. They're not going to uh, cave in. They're not going to bow. Um, and as a result, God delivered them from that fiery furnace. We learned some things about this whole situation and what happened here in verse number 28. First of all, we see three things that God did in verse number 28. Number one, he sent an angel. The Bible says in verse number 28, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach and, uh, uh, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel. So God sent an angel. Of course, we know according to verse number 25, that is a pre-incarnate form of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He was there with them in the fire. 
Uh, verse 25 says, And he answered and, and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. In that fire with them was the Lord Jesus Christ actually walking with them and protecting them against the fire. And God chose to deliver them out of that fire at that time, and he sent his angel to protect them. The Lord Jesus Christ was there amongst them. What else do we see here that God did? Number two, we see three things. Number one, he sent an angel. Number two, he delivered his servants. It says here in verse number 28, um, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. He gave them deliverance from the punishment that they were supposed to take because they refused to bow. So God sent an angel, gave them protection while they were there. Of course, as a result of that, uh, he delivered them from this fiery furnace and they were not going to not only... Or they're not going to be burned up. They won't even have any, any sign of even being in there. Not a hair was singed, the Bible says, nor were their clothes even smell like they were in the fire. Who's ever been around a campfire? And you sat around the campfire, and for some reason the smoke is attracted to you. Doesn't it always seem like when you begin to move around, the smoke just follows you? It's like once the smoke is on you, it won't go away. So you move around the side of the campfire and it starts coming your direction. <laughs> I love campfires. They're great. I love s'mores. I love campfires. I love the heat. I love all, everything about it. I just don't like the smell in your clothes afterwards. And the Bible says that they came out of that fire and not only did God deliver them, you couldn't even smell. The fire had been on them. Uh, there was a great deliverance there. Not only did he send an angel, not only did he deliver his servants, but number three, he changed the king's word, the Bible says in verse 28. All right, so it says, Who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word. Now, we live in a completely different society than that of Babylon, and praise the Lord, we do. <laughs> but one thing that you have to understand, this is a big deal, the fact that they could take God, uh, the king's word, a decree that was made, and have him change his word. That was huge. That was monumental. It was really unheard of, unprecedented. You don't change what the king has said. Um, uh, uh, under a system like that they had, uh, you had to be very careful the words that you used. Be very careful of the things that you said, because you would never want to say anything contrary to what the king has said. You'd never want to say anything contrary to um, uh, a decree made by the king. Certainly you wouldn't want to say anything my dad used to say back in the, when I was a kid, back in the, the 80s, that you could say anything you want in Russia once. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, you know, they, here we have a situation where you would never say anything in contrary to the king, let alone have the king change his words. But yet that's what God said. That's what his word said. And here's what happened. All right. Uh, he sent an angel. He delivered a servant and he changed the king's word. Now, important to note this. That's all what God did. And that's all God would, what God decided to do. God didn't have to decide to do that. God can do whatever he wants. I've often time when, I've, when I have prayed and we say we want to ask God to do something for our church or for someone we're praying for or whatever, uh, that God is not on trial. And God is still God, even if he doesn't answer our prayer. And he's still in control and he knows what's best. And we need to have the faith to accept whatever it is that we're asking God to do if he decides not to do it. And these are all things that God had done. And according to this verse, he sent an angel, he delivered his servants, and he changed the king's word, all what God had done, and he didn't have to do any of those things. But let's look what they did, what the three Hebrew boys did. How did the three Hebrew boys, what did the three Hebrew boys do according to this verse? All right, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, that trusted in him. So here we have what we can do and what they did, three things that we see they did. Number one, they trusted in him. Now there again, remember now, God has sent an angel and delivered them and changed the king's word, but that's all in the hands of God and he can do whatever he wants to do. Um, he is sovereign, but we know we can do what uh, uh, these, these three, three Hebrew boys did. Okay, They trusted in him. And certainly, we can trust in the Lord. Certainly, we can say to ourselves, God, I'm putting my trust and my faith in you with my future, with uh, my plans, whatever it is you have for my life. 
I'm trusting in you. You are in control. Uh, and, and sure, things right now may not make perfect sense. It doesn't seem like the road's very clear in the direction I'm going to go. But Lord, I'm trusting you. And we see that they trusted him. Number two, they yielded their bodies. The Bible says in verse number 28, um, See who has sent an angel and delivered the servants unto, who, that trusted in him. And have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies. They said, we're going to give up our own bodies into this fiery furnace for the sake of the God that we serve. And they said, God, whatever I have, it's yours. Whatever, whatever I, I have, whatever I do with my life, whatever I do with this body you've given to me, with this flesh that I have, it's yours. And man, is that a struggle. So often we want to do... <laughs> what our flesh desires to do. I don't know what it is, you know, about my life lately, but I have been forced into some early mornings. Now, if anybody you know me very well, you know I'm not naturally a morning person. Okay, I would easily, I would easily sleep until 9, 10 o'clock if I could. I don't do that. You can rest assured your pastor doesn't sleep in until 10 o'clock. <laughs> but I would if I could. Uh, if I had the opportunity. Some people naturally get up early in the morning. Some people are like that. They're wide awake, ready to go, 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, and they don't need any kind of, you know, they wake up five minutes before the alarm clock goes off, they jump out of bed, you know, they, they're ready to go, they don't need coffee, they don't need nothing. Now, they have coffee because they like it, but they don't need it, they're ready to go, they're wired. And the problem with those people is they're up so early in the morning. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, it's just not right that they're up that early in the morning naturally, okay? Not how many people got evidence for that, but it's just not right. <laughs> that being said, I'm not that kind of a person. And lately, for whatever reason, lately, all right, I have had to be up early in the morning, whether I'm helping somebody out or going to meet somebody or whatever. And, and uh, there was a time this week when I was, no kidding, I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning and then went to the whole rest of the day. I just had to be up early. Um, and uh, that's, that's very unusual. I've never had to be up that early. But usually I have to get up about 5 o'clock in the morning if I want to stay ahead of the game and get to everything that I want to get to uh, that day. Um, that is not something I want to do, not naturally. I don't like getting up that early. I don't like being an early person, and I have to get myself out of bed in order to do that. I have to make myself get up, and usually the alarm clock will go off at 5 o'clock, and I'll lay there for 5 to 10 minutes with all the 100 reasons why I could lay here 5 more minutes. It goes through my mind. Oh, I can make it. I can figure it out. I could do it. Uh, but then I get up because I know I need to get up. All right. My flesh does not want to give up, get up <laughs> or give up. <laughs> uh, but I know I need to because God's got a lot for me to do that day. And we yield to our flesh. All right. And we have bad results. But when we yield their bodies over to the Lord, when we say, God, Whatever it is you would have me to do, I give my body over to you. You can have it. You can. Uh, I'm going to bring my flesh into subjection to whatever it is you would have me to do, Lord. And that's exactly what they did. They're going to give up the very bodies they have for the sake of Christ and go into the fiery furnace. This is something they can decide to do. They trusted God. They yielded their bodies. And the Bible says that they served and worshipped their God. Notice what it says here. And yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any God except their own God. So they trusted God, they yielded their bodies, and they served and worshipped God. So you and I have a choice every day. We can trust the Lord. We can yield our bodies, and we can serve and worship the Lord as these three Hebrew children did. Lesson from the Hebrew children. Let me give you several observations tonight, five different observations from this passage of scripture. We saw what God did. He sent an angel. He delivered his servants, and he changed the king's word. We see what the three Hebrew boys did. They trusted in him yielded their bodies and served and worshiped God. Now let me give you some observations concerning these thoughts that I've given to you tonight already so far. I want you to keep in mind now, what God did is up to him. He doesn't have to do anything. In this particular situation, he sent an angel and delivered a service and changed the king's word, but that was up to God. We also have a free will, and we can choose not to trust the Lord. We can choose not to yield our bodies over to him, and we can choose not to serve and worship God. But yet we see that God will deliver us or deliver them as they trusted, yielded, and served and worshiped the Lord. Let me give you several observations. Number one, observations about the three Hebrew boys. Number one, we will have an opportunity to take a stand. There's going to come a time in your life when you will have an opportunity to take a stand for the Lord. Notice if you would, verse number five and six. Verse number five says that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, 
harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music. You fall down and worship the, the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up, and whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There was an opportunity for them to make a, de a decision, an opportunity for them to take a stand as they were told to do something that they knew they should not do because they worship the true living God. You will have an opportunity to take a stand. You will have to make a choice. There's going to come in all of our lives, lives temptation to do wrong. Now, the Lord knows where you're at, and he knows what your weaknesses are. And Satan knows where you're at, and Satan knows what your weaknesses are. And Satan's going to do everything he can to make you unproductive for the Lord Jesus Christ and Satan knows what temptations you're bringing to your life to keep you from being effective. And you have to decide right now, I'm not going to give in to those things. I'm going to yield my body to the Lord and his will. And I'm going to yield to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to guide. Because you will have an opportunity this week coming up to take a stand and to do right. It may not be as, as broad and grand as a thing as a giant golden image that you're told to kneel down to. And by the way, sometimes it's those big things that I think a lot of believers would take a stand with, but Satan is subtle. And he knows it's those little things that you'll give in to. If the government were to pass a law today and were to say across the board, federal law, we are no longer allowed to hand out gospel tracts on the streets, or door to door. If the government were to pass this law and say Christians are no longer allowed to do that. And I said to you, we're going to go out there and do it anyways because this is wrong and we know it's wrong. I'd probably get a big crowd. A lot of believers would say, no, we're standing up against this. We know it's right to do. All right, where were you yesterday? <laughs> it's right to do before the government makes that kind of a law. It's right to do afterwards. It's just right to do. And sometimes we take a stand when there's a big you know, opposition to us, but Satan's smarter than that. Satan will come into our lives subtly and try to trip us up in things that are not as big of a deal or not so publicly seen. And you're going to be tempted with something this week that you could get away with that no one else will know about it, and it would just be between you and the Lord. Are you going to take a stand during that time? Are you going to take a stand when you are tempted to have that bad thought about somebody else and, and tell them what you think of them in your mind. Are you going to take a stand, gentlemen, when you have an opportunity to look at something you know is wrong on your computer and no one else will know about it and no one else is going to see what you're looking at, but are you going to take a stand and do right? Are you going to take a stand when it comes to your temper? Are you going to take a stand when it comes to that besetting sin that nobody else knows about? We will all have an opportunity to take a stand this week. You will uh, have a chance to make a choice. Uh, there may come a time when you are faced with a choice to do right or wrong, and you have to choose right. Um, uh, today we lack moral courage. We lack, you know, we, we, we all know what it is to have this no fear. It's popular for a while for people to put this no fear bumper sticker on their car, and they would do these extreme sports, you know, and they would, uh, you know, they would, whatever they're doing, they're snowboarding off the side of a mountain in Alaska somewhere that's way up in the air, and, you know, the, the camera guy never gets credit for anything and just recording them going down the hill, you know. But uh, there, there's all these no-fear extreme sports and people taking skateboards and micro motorcycles and, 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 and jumping away in the air and doing flips and toss, all that stuff, you know, so cool. And those guys have no fear. Uh, and the truth of the matter is we don't need that. We need moral courage. We need people who are going to take a stand when it comes to doing morally right or wrong. And there's going to come an opportunity coming up when you have to take a stand for right and you have to decide, I'm going to do right and make the right, right choice. And we oftentimes lack moral courage. Okay, number one, observation about the three Hebrew boys. Okay, we will all have an opportunity to take a stand. They had an opportunity to take a stand there. Number two, what you do during those times will be noticed by others. When you take a stand and you do right, that will be noticed by others. Notice if you would verse number 12. Verse number 12 says that there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. People could certainly see 
that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not bowing down like they should have. And no matter what you think of that little sin you're involved in, it is going to affect others. Hey, we all have relationships in our lives. Some of us are dads, <laughs> moms and dads. You better watch yourself because the actions you take are going to have much greater effect on your children than you realize. And you have more influence on your children than anybody else in this world. Um, and, and we may have an opportunity to influence them in some way. We praise God that we have that opportunity in the Christian school. And as a pastor and as our church, we may have an opportunity to influence them in some way with our youth group and with our services. And, and we, we don't take that lightly. We want to uplift the name of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can have some sort of an influence on them. But hey, you as a mom and dad have great influence, far more than I think we realize at times. And they're picking up on things that we don't realize they're picking up on. You know, I, I tend to think of Marcus, our youngest. He's four years old. He's going to be five in November. And I tend, because he doesn't speak, he doesn't talk a lot, doesn't say a lot of words. He's saying more words now, but he doesn't say a lot. Our tendency has been think, uh, to think of him as younger than what he really is. And as a result of that, and anybody who has kids has been through the stage where they're two, three years old, and, and, and you think they don't really catch on to a lot necessarily, but then all of a sudden they'll say something or do something, and you think to yourself, wow, they really are catching on a lot. Uh, you know, isn't it great when they repeat you at school, say something you said at home? <laughs> isn't it great when they, when they, when they, when you're in a public place and they repeat, you know, something you said at home, or oh, you know, what Dad's favorite TV show is, and you go, quiet, good. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and when they repeat things out loud, you know, you don't realize how much influence you're having over those children. And no, the decision that we make, they're going to affect others around us. No matter where you are in life, you have someone that is watching you. You have somebody that is going to be influenced when you do wrong, when you uh, make a bad decision. There are the critics who are going to watch and look for you to trip up, and there are the others who are going to be hurt and heartbroken as you make bad decisions, all right? What you do during those times of your uh, of opportunities to take a stand, what you do during those times, let me know by others. Number three, your stand may cost you something. Verse number 20, uh, in our passage of Scripture, verse number 20, and he commanded the most mighty men that were in the arm, uh, in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And the stand that we take may cost us something, but the truth of the matter is, it is important that we do right in spite of the cost. Do right in spite of whatever it may cost us. And do right in spite of what the world may think of us. And we do right according to the word of God, in spite of what others are going to say and criticize us with. Number one, you will have an opportunity to take a stand. Number two, what you do during those times will be noticed by others. Number three, your stand may cost you something. Number four... There is no guarantee that you'll be delivered. Now, I think this is important for us to understand. As I mentioned at the beginning in verse number 28, we saw three things that God did. He sent an angel. He delivered his servants. And he changed the king's word. These are important things, and we see that God did a great deliverance there. But that was up to God to do that. And God is not on trial tonight. And we don't have to, we don't, we are not guaranteed that God's going to deliver us because deliverance is what God did and it's totally up to him whether he will do that for you or not. And it may be that God needs you to go through this trial for a whole other reason that we don't understand. He may need you to go through this temptation and for you to walk through the fire and he may choose not to deliver you from that fire for a whole other reason. And we say, a pastor like this, we say, man, God's going to deliver us out of the burning fire for his city. He may not. Notice if you would in verse number 17. There are no guarantees that you will be delivered. Verse number 17, here we have the king and he, he confronted the Hebrew boys and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and uh, he said, uh, we're going to toss you into a fiery furnace if you don't bow down when you hear the music. And uh, the end of verse number 15, he says, and who is that God that should deliver you out of my hand? He said, uh, I've built this image, and you need to bow down to this image. And what kind of God do you have that's going to deliver you out of my hand? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in such a matter. In other words, we're going to be very careful how we answer you in this. We, we need to be careful about this. Verse number 17, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able 
to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Now we know he can deliver us out of that burning fiery furnace. He's able to do that. And we know he's going to deliver us out of your hand, O king. We don't know what the exact plan is, though, because verse number 18 says, but if not, even if he doesn't deliver us, all right, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. If he's not going to deliver us, that doesn't change a thing. We're still not going to worship the golden image you've set up, and we're still not going to uh, uh, bow down to you because we serve a God as much greater than all of that. And even if it doesn't work out the way we'd like it to work out, we're still going to worship God, and we're not going to worship your golden image. And it is not for us to decide what God's will is. It is for us to say, I'm going to trust, yield, and serve. And God can do as he wants. All right? The three Hebrew boys were willing to do what they did, whether or not God was going to deliver them in the way he did. Okay, There's no guarantee you will be delivered uh, in your trial, your circumstance. Number five, no matter what God decides to do, we need to trust, yield, obey, and worship. We trust God, we yield to him, we're obedient to him, and we worship him. We give him the glory. And there are going to be times when we are sent into the fiery furnace. There are going to be times when we are, when we are sent into um, uh, to a place where we have to take a stand. And God will uh, do it uh, a glorious work through that. And, and he'll deliver us out of the hands of those who would want to mock us and, and will say, praise God, he delivered us. Then there'll be times when we take a stand and we're just further ridiculed. And it just seems like it doesn't get us anywhere. It just seems like, boy, we're just taking the stand and we're doing right, but yet God hasn't been doing anything in our lives. It doesn't seem like we're blessed in any way through all this. And we say no matter what it is, no matter what it is, what the outcome is, we trust, yield, obey, and worship because God is in control. He can deliver us from the fiery furnace. And no doubt, if he does or if he doesn't, we need to worship God and not worship the golden image. And let me tell you something. We need to trust and yield, obey, and worship, no matter what God decides to do with the outcome of what we're going through. We trust him, we yield, we obey, and we worship. Wonderful, wonderful lessons from this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're going to be tempted this week. You're going to be put into the fire furnace at some time in your life. Are you going to trust, yield, obey, and worship the Lord? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time we have to be in your word. And Lord, we do thank you that you can, you have the ability to deliver us no matter what trial we go into. And Lord, we, you have the ability and are all, all powerful. But Lord, we do know that you are sovereign and that you know what is best for us in our lives. Help us to accept, Lord, your will whatever it may be. And as we face the fiery furnaces of our own lives, may we simply trust and yield and obey and worship. May we have the faith, Lord, to do right before you, no matter what comes in our path. With our head bowed and our eyes closed, we're going to give an invitation tonight. Maybe God's spoken to your heart. Maybe you're facing something that no one is even aware of, a difficulty you're going through, maybe a relationship problem or or some kind of a health problem, or whatever the case may be. You're, you're dealing with something, and you say, you know what? I just need to trust, I need to yield, I need to obey, and I need to worship and praise the Lord. And you say, in spite of what I'm going through, I just need to do those things before God. God does what's best. God may or may not deliver you. But we can all trust, and we can all yield, and we can all obey, and we can all worship. If God speak into your heart, when we have an invitation, you come forward. Make a decision for him. Let's all stand as we stand together. The piano begins to play. God speaking to you. This altar is open for you if you need to make a decision tonight.